And it's so crazy. I remember I literally like sat up in bed and walked to the wheelchair because my brain was just so focused on the babies. And not to say that that pain didn't come back because it did. It was a C-section, but like I, I was so worried about both of them, but especially about him. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast where you'll gain the knowledge and confidence you need to erase the unknowns of pregnancy and birth and rock the newborn days like a boss. My name is Liesl Teen. I'm a fellow mom, labor and delivery nurse, and your host. Each week on this podcast, you'll hear a mix of birth stories, expert interviews, and other fun pregnancy and birth-related content. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now let's get into this week's episode. This week on the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, I have a birth story to share with you guys from Heather Evans. After four years of infertility, Heather began her motherhood journey in 2013 when her when her twins, Hannah and Gavin, were born at 24 weeks and one day gestation. Tiny little babies. At just one and a half pounds each, the twins were immediately innovated and remained on ventilators for seven weeks. They battled brain hemorrhages, infections infections, constant respiratory distress, feeding dysfunction, and more. They were in the NICU for a total of 122 days, coming home on oxygen and apnea monitors one day before their four-month birthday. Heather reached out to me to share her story because she hopes that it will help those with infertility, those considering egg donation, mamas of multiples, preemie moms, and moms of kiddos with special needs. And furthermore, her career as a pelvic health PT offers insight to all moms. So cool. She wears so many hats. (laughs) Without further ado, let's get into Heather's story. Wondering what you need to do to stay on track during each week of pregnancy? Not sure what you need to be learning or researching along the way? I can help. Sign up for our free weekly pregnancy series to get tips, advice, and resources tailored to your exact week of pregnancy sent straight to your inbox every week. Sign up at mommylabornurse.com slash I am pregnant to get your first email today. See you in your inbox real soon. Hi, Heather. Welcome to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. Thanks so much for being here today with me. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing a birth story today. Heather, do you mind telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, all that good stuff? Sure. So my name is Heather Evans. I live in Lee Summit, Missouri. So that's a suburb of Kansas City. And I have been married to my husband for about 12 years. And we have eight-year-old twins. So Hannah and Gavin. Very cool. Very cool. And we're going to talk about their birth story today, which was very interesting. (laughs) Very jam-packed, lots of things happening. So usually what I have people do is kind of go back to when you found out you were pregnant with them, if you had any, you know, issues with infertility or losses or anything like that, and then talk about your pregnancy, first trimester, second trimester. I know we're going to have a little issues with the third trimester, but we can, and then we can go into birth story. Sure. So yes, we actually, we're one of the couples that did struggle a lot with infertility. So we went through four years of infertility. So I had had to have a surgery where I get a certain type of ovarian cyst that doesn't just go away on its own. And so I had had one rupture and then I had another one that had kind of invaded one um, tube and ovaries. So I have had that, I had to have surgery to have that taken out. It was kind of a long story, but we basically did four different rounds of IVF. And on our fourth round, we actually chose to use an egg donor. And it was a really hard decision, but I am so, so happy that we did what we did. And once we used the egg donor, our IVF cycle went so much better. And um, that's what led us to actually having our twins. And so I finally got that positive pregnancy test. We actually were using a fertility clinic out of St. Louis. So we were in Kansas City. We were going back and forth to St. Louis. And it really like once we got that positive pregnancy test, everything went really, really well throughout 
pregnancy. So I I mean, I was a little bit nauseous, but I wasn't all that sick. I didn't really have too many aches and pains. It was, especially for having twins, I really did pretty great. I was um, a pelvic floor physical therapist. And so I was continuing to work full time and we were just really excited. I was definitely a little bit nervous just because of everything that we had been through. And then a little bit nervous about, you know, having twins, but it was all, you know, starting to come together. And so first trimester was actually pretty simple. And then second trimester was basically what I say was, it was really, really easy until all of a sudden it wasn't. So everything had been going fine. I was actually starting to feel really, really good. And I had a regular OBGYN appointment. So I went in, they had done all the normal things. So like the heartbeat check and the belly ultrasound. And so at this point I was about 21 weeks and my doctor at the time, he was being extra super cautious with me just because of our fertility history and the fact that I did have twins. And so he wanted to do a transvaginal ultrasound to check the cervix, which not necessarily something they always do at that point. So I am very, very thankful that he chose to do that. But so I was actually getting ready to leave my appointment. And he said, you know what, I would like you to do that. So I went back in and I had that ultrasound. And then of course, you know, the tech didn't tell me anything. She went and got him and they found out that my cervix was what they were, was called funneling. So basically it was shortening. It was dilating kind of from the top. So they just said, okay, let's just put you on bed rest at home and see how you do and come back in about two days. So I did that and it was okay still. So they said, okay, go home for the weekend and come back on Monday. And so when I went back on Monday, everything kind of just turned upside down. So that was 22 weeks and five days. Basically the cervix had shortened a whole lot more. So nurses came running in, my doctor came running in, they brought a wheelchair and at the whole time I felt completely fine. And so it was just really surreal because I felt like I was completely fine and you could tell that there was obviously a lot going on. And so they rushed in with the wheelchair. They told me not to push, which I was like, why on earth would I be pushing? I don't feel like I have to push, but okay. I <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm thankful I didn't feel it, but it just made it so strange. And so they rushed me into another room and my OB came in and he checked and he was like, you're already, you're a half centimeter dilated. You are a hundred percent effaced. We need to rush you to the hospital right now. So, and I don't think I fully understood what was going on. I think I was just so in such a state that my, the logical part of my brain just wasn't really registering it. I was just kind of like, okay, I was just following directions. So his office was in a building right across the street from the hospital. And so they put me in this wheelchair and then they wheeled me across the hospital to antepartum. And they basically, and I was still a little confused. Like, I don't think I understood yet that I was going to stay there. And so they're giving me a gown and they're, you know, doing, and and it's not because they weren't doing a great job. They were doing a really great job. It's just, they were trying to take care of all of the medical things at one time. So, you know, later I found out they really thought the babies were coming pretty much that night. Like then, yeah, they were prepping for delivery. And that's why they were like, don't push, you know, just everything. And I still felt fine. So they hooked me up to the monitors. They showed I was having contractions, even though I could not feel them. And they just started giving me what medication they could. So they gave me a start of, they gave me a steroid shot to help improve baby's lung function. And then they gave me another medication and it's, it's not magnesium. I can't remember what it was. It was some oral medication that you could just take for a few days to try to slow labor. In Indocin, um, maybe? Maybe. Maybe. That could be, I'm not sure. I don't remember the name of it, but something that they could give me for a few days and then they couldn't go past that. So we finally, they said, okay, you know, here's what's going on. We're planning to have you stay in the hospital. So my husband ran home, fed our pets, packed my stuff and came back. And so then all the teams started coming in. And so the NICU team came in, the high risk doctors came in. Um, everybody kind of just explaining what was going on because at the time, eight years ago, they typically didn't resuscitate babies born at 22 weeks, that same hospital now. And I know a lot of hospitals will, but eight years ago, very few 22 weekers were being intubated and, and saved. So they pretty much told us, should the babies come tonight, 
you know, if they look like they're giving a really big effort, we will try everything we can, but they were basically trying to very gently prepare us for the fact that if they came that night, they probably wouldn't be able to do very much. So, you know, we hadn't even chosen names yet. We hadn't done our hospital tour, baby shower, none of that, because it was just 22 weeks. So my husband and I, we stayed up, we decided we wanted them to have names, no matter what happened, we wanted to have names and we didn't want to rush and figure them out in a terrible circumstance. And so we stayed up until we had picked the names of our babies. And then I think they gave me some sleeping medicine and I, we went to sleep and woke up the next morning and they were still there. And so I think everybody fully expected to have them come that night and they surprised everybody and just stayed exactly where they should be. Good, so, good. So now you're 22 and six the next day? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so then they were able, every day helped so much because they could give me a second round of the steroids to improve the baby's lung function. And so they pretty much just said, you are here on antepartum for as long as we can. You know, hopefully you're here for a really long time. And they, you know, it was crazy. They I didn't even get up to go to the bathroom. Like they brought me a bedside commode because they said they're so tiny. They might just slip out, which is just crazy. And so I would just move just a little bit to there and back. And I just sort of settled in. I started reading books, watched TV and just tried to stay, you know, as calm as I could. So at 23 weeks, the NICU team came in and said at 23 weeks, they would attempt to resuscitate the babies if the parents gave their consent. And again, this is probably all different now, but um, so of course we wanted to give our consent. So we signed the forms and said, do whatever you need to do. And so that was set. And then I managed to stay there until 24 weeks and one day. So everything stayed very much the same until about 1.30 in the morning on the 20, and on that day, 24 weeks and one day. So I woke up in the middle of the night and definitely had what was a contraction. Now I don't feel like I ever had strong contractions like people have when they're in labor. It just felt like a really strong period cramp, but I had not felt anything up until that time. Yeah. So you're so like a red flag immediately. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so I woke up my husband and we paged the nurse and then I got up and went to the bathroom and there was a little bit of blood. And so we knew this was, you know, things were changing. And so they, you know, suddenly everybody was in the room and they had all the monitors and the lights were on and they realized that I labor was basically coming at that point. So I was starting to dilate. So then that point they gave me magnesium, which as everyone knows is terrible, but so they give it to you. You basically feel like you're in the middle of a fire. So we had the AC cranked as cold as it could go and all the sheets stripped off and all, like my husband was standing me and everyone else had sweatshirts on, but, but it really didn't change anything. And so the doctors, the OBs changed shifts and the new one came in and she said, okay, these babies are coming. I'm going to go check on a couple patients and then I'll be back. So now we're talking like mm, mid morning ish, probably. So the NICU teams were on alert. They basically moved me to the closest delivery room that they had to the OR because they were hoping to do a C-section just to keep everything as controlled as possible. But in case they came sooner, they had the warming beds and everything all down just, just in case. And then they were the same. They were like, do not push, you know, nothing like that. And so they hung in there for that last little bit of time. And, you know, then they just got us ready for the C-section. And so that's where we went from that. And so was your, were you able to stay awake for that or did they put you under general? I was. Okay. And I'm super thankful for that because I know that's not the case for a lot of people. So what they did, and they told me that they, they were really good about telling me everything that was going to happen before. So it was, I mean, of course it was scary, but when you're warned, you know, they're going to have a breathing tube, they're not going to cry, things like that. It does help, but they were able to give me just the regular final for the C-section. And what they did was, so my daughter, Hannah, she was baby A, so she was first. And so they took her out and they held her above the drape for just like 
one to two seconds so I could see her. And she was blowing bubbles. I will never forget Aww. that. She was blowing little bubbles. <laughs> I didn't cry, of course, but, and then they took her. And so in the room, there were all the doctors and nurses and people for me. And then each baby had a team. So each one had the isolate and then they had a neonatologist, a neonatal, um, neonatal nurse practitioner, a nurse and a respiratory therapist, and then times two. So they listed so lots away. of people, <laughs> lots of people. There were yeah. about 50 people, I think in this room. And so they started intubating her and then Gavin, who's my son, he was transverse. So he was sideways. And so they had to work a little bit harder to get him out. And he was a little bruised when he came out. Same thing. They held him up for just a second and then whisked him to his team. And so then I, then I can't see anything and I can't hear anything. And so, you know, my husband's kind of next to me, sort of telling me what's going on. He kind of went over there, but also just really, you're scared of like getting in the way. And so I do remember him telling me, like, like he kept saying, they're still working on him. They're still working on him because they had a really hard time getting Gavin intubated. And they did do chest compressions at birth, which I did not know until later. His heart was beating. It was just beating really slow. So they eventually did get him intubated. So they basically took the isolates and sprinted out of the room. So I'll never forget the one of the nurses, one of Hannah's nurses. as And they paused for just a second as they're sprinting out of the room so you can kind of see the baby again. And she, she just paused and she said, congratulations, mama. And it just blew me away because the whole thing was, it was terrifying and it was very medical and an emergency. And I hadn't even thought about the fact that I was a mom, you know, I, we were just hoping they could, you know, would make it. And so I'll never forget that. And she turned out to be one of our very favorite nurses. So they whisked them both in our hospital. That was the third floor. And the NICU was on the fourth floor. So they whisked them away and at that point, I, I just had a lot of medication in my system, I think, because from there, the next about 12 hours is really hazy. I told my husband, because he said, do you want me to stay with you? Do you want me to go with them? And I said, no, go with them, go with them. So he went up there. He took some pictures for me. One of the NICU doctors, you know, explained what a lot of the tubes were and showed him the tour, which was really nice because then my husband could show me those things later. But I, so I got some pictures, I got some stats. So they're about a pound and a half each and they were just a little under a foot long each. You know, they were so early, their eyes were still a few shut. Of course they couldn't breathe. They have the ventilator tubes and, you know, all of the wires and IVs and all of the different things, but they had made it past step one, which was just. And that's process. a big step. And that is a big it step. A just getting on the outside. Step. Yeah. Yes. Well, I want to hear before we, because I want to hear about their NICU journey and just everything regarding that. You know, we have a fair amount of moms who listen who end up having, you know, preemie and they have a NICU journey or they have babies full term and they have babies in the NICU. So I know a lot of people just want to hear other people's stories, right? But I do want to hear about how those neck, because you, you obviously kind of had to stay probably down on that floor for a little bit before you went and saw them. Yes. So again, it's a little hazy. I definitely remember being awake when they do the, what is it called? The, the fundal massage or fundal the, rubs, they, yeah. Yeah, the kind of one. So you remember painful. those? Cause those aren't I remember that, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. but I remember that because, and I also remember that was about the time my husband came back down with the pictures. And so I stayed in that kind of recovery room for a while and then they moved me to, it, I'm pretty sure it was on the mother baby unit, but thankfully they put me at the very, very end. So I didn't hear all the babies crying and things like that as much. So I think they were being very kind of tactful about that. And then I, I think I honestly, with the medicines, I was very in and out for a while. Like I know we had visitors that I don't remember. Apparently I ate something at some point. I have no recollection of that. I have a very small memory when they took me from the recovery room before they took me to the mother baby room. They actually took, since I had to stay flat, they took my entire bed upstairs to the NICU so that I could see the babies. I was still kind of laying down, but you could see them in their isolates. And I have a very, very small memory of that, but I do remember that happening. So they took my whole bed upstairs 
showed me both babies and they took my bed back downstairs to where I would then stay. So then the next thing I remember, which actually turned out to be the next time I really got to see them. So I woke up at, they woke me up at about 12 hours after I delivered to try to start pumping. And so around midnight, the nurse came in and helped me sit up for the first time. And when your babies are that early, at least in my case, you, you're pumping, but nothing's really happening. Like you're trying to get something out, but they're just trying to get things started. So she helped me sit up at that point. It was really painful. You know how you would expect from a C-section and, you know, tried pumping, laid back down. That was that about an hour later. So about one 30 in the morning, one of the NICU nurse practitioners came downstairs and sat with us. And she said, I just wanted to let you know that Gavin is not doing very well. And she said, we don't feel like we're in danger of losing him just yet, but he had to be placed. He had to have some surfactant treatments, which is like what the lungs form to kind of keep things open, but the babies were too early to have it. Yeah. So they had that. And then they had to put him on a higher powered ventilator called an oscillator where it just kind of, it almost like it it shakes the baby a little bit. It looks like, but it's just a lot more oxygen going in. So she just wanted to tell me that. And then, so she left and the nurse came in and said, do you want to go see them? And it's so crazy. I remember I literally like sat up in bed and walked to the wheelchair because my brain was just so focused on the babies And not to say that that pain didn't come back because it did, it was a C-section, but like I, I was so worried about both of them, but especially about him. So this amazing nurse took us upstairs and my husband had been able to go back and forth in between, but I hadn't yet. So she wheeled me upstairs and the twins, because at the time they were the sickest babies on the floor, they were at a certain area and then they were right next to each other. And so, and they were one-to-one nursing because they were so sick. And so she took me to each of the rooms and the nurses were amazing. They were very busy because the kids were giving them kind of a tough time, but they were so good about saying, okay, this, you know, this is the, this goes into his belly button and that's for this. And then this is his ventilator tube and same thing with Hannah. And so I could just kind of make sure they were okay. And then they took me back downstairs. And then by the next morning, I feel like was when we really started our kind of our routine. Like, okay, we're going to wake up. We're going to go to the NICU. And I had recovered enough that, I mean, I used the wheelchair for a little bit, but we kind of just said, okay, this is what we're dealing with. This is the situation we're in. And we're just going to do what we need to do. New normal. Yeah. You just have to take it you know, it's not day by day. It's like minute by minute so much in there. So yeah. 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 And were they still encouraging you to pump every few hours? Yeah. So I would pump about every three hours and I, then uh, there was a lactation consultant that came in at some point the next day. So I think I'd done probably two or three rounds of trying to pump without anything happening. And she came in and taught me how to start hand expressing milk And that actually started things off really well. And so in the beginning, you know, having them born so early before your body's so ready, I would just, they give you these little vials in the NICU. I mean, they're the size of like your pinky finger. Yeah. It's like a one, you know, half, 0.1 milliliter. You can get a couple drops out. Right. Yeah. So, and then, so I would do that every three hours and then that would be, even throughout the night. And then that would be, I would just take a little trip. I got to where I could walk because even though it was upstairs, it wasn't very, I could go up the elevator and didn't have to walk very much. And so every three hours, that's kind of how I started building some strength back up. I would take that teeny tiny little vial because my husband definitely offered to take it for me. And I wanted to go see them, of course. And I'd take it up there and the nurses were like, oh, that's great. Good job. Keep going. They were so encouraging because at that point they, they couldn't even take feeds yet. So they were just storing those little vials. And then down the road, when they started to do feeds, I mean, they would get like half a milliliter. So yeah, even though it wasn't very much milk, yeah. yeah, it was all they really needed. And so I'm trying to think probably by about the time I left the hospital, I was doing more with the pumping as opposed to the hand expressing the milk. I never was able. And then 
not to jump ahead, but later on the breastfeeding story does change a little bit when they were able to feed. I was never a huge producer. I never would have had enough to fully support two babies uh, because they were so little, they were mixing it with formula whenever they were starting to eat from the beginning to gain, to add calories. So yeah, it basically like, works for what they needed. I think they call it fortified. They fortify yes, the- That's what yeah. it was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, the sound of that baby crying means it's time for this week's segment of Birth It Up Babies. All right, this one says, I am sure you get this a lot, but thank you! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Oh, I have followed you since I found out I was pregnant. I don't remember how I found your page, but that doesn't matter. I guess it doesn't. <laughs> Reading, watching, and following you really made a huge impact on my labor. I took your natural birthing course and it prepared me for everything. My birthing team was so surprised at how knowledgeable I was and how I took the tools that you taught me to labor and birth. Again, I cannot thank you enough. Oh, I love that. So sweet. If you want to check out the course that this mama took, she took Birth It Up, the natural series, and you can head over to mommylabornurse.com and click on the natural series. All right, let's get right back into this week's episode. Yeah. Well, I want to know, okay, so you had a C-section, so you probably stayed three-ish nights, right, in the hospital? Okay. And so then they probably discharge you. And sometimes, I know at my hospital, sometimes they have areas where you can stay there, like you don't have to go home. So did you end up doing that or did you guys go home or did you kind of do a mix of both? We were only about 30 minutes away and our hospital does take in, it, it was a, it's a really high level NICU. And so they will take in people that live a lot further away. So we just always went home. Now I will say at some point, like my son had to have a surgery and things like that. They would always offer you to stay for those things. I think it somewhat depends on availability. But we also kind of thought, you know, we're only 30 minutes away and a lot of these people are coming from over an hour. And so... And you're um, much more comfortable usually at your home. So it's like if you can do the drive back and forth, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I hear you. Well, let's talk about... I want to know kind of when they... Because they were still kind of, you know, pretty immediately sick right right after they were born. I want to know kind of that process getting to... They call them growers and eaters or growers and... Feeders and, and feeders, usually. And feeders, yep. yes. Yep. So I want to know kind of that process. When did you feel like you were like, okay, we're going to make it home? I feel like the big turn, like the big corner we turned was when they came off the ventilators. So they were on the ventilators for seven weeks. And during that time is when they were definitely the sickest. Like when they were, even when they were on the ventilators, their oxygen would still drop or their heart rates would drop. And that pretty much went on for weeks, um, for multiple weeks. And they told us it would. My son had a surgery about three weeks called a PDA ligation. So basically there's a little opening that in a heart vessel that normally closes when the baby's born, but with preemies and micro preemies, which is what the babies were called, sometimes it doesn't. So he had that surgery that did help him. Like he was definitely the whole time our sickest baby. His oxygen would drop into the 30s and 40s sometimes. Super scary. That surgery definitely helped him. And then they really just, sometimes they do trials where they decrease the oxygen and they would say they're just working too hard. And so they wanted them to just get bigger. So in about seven weeks, they were able to come off the vents. Actually, I take that back. So Gavin was on the oscillator vent for about a week. So then he went to the regular vent. The hardest part during that entire seven weeks was about week two, they did head ultrasounds of the brain. And that's when they find out if they have, it's called intraventricular hemorrhages. It's bleeding in their brain, basically from the ox, or from the high oxygen. So Hannah had a grade two. So it's one to four. So one is the mildest and four is the worst. Um, Hannah had a two and then Gavin had a two on one side and a four on the other side. And so, you know, that's when social work started coming in and the charge nurse and they gave you so much support, but that was definitely 
the hardest day of our entire stay, potentially my whole life, quite honestly. And so, but anyway, so we get them to about seven weeks. Hannah is able to move on to, it's a CPAP machine, but I think it started with BiPAP, if I remember. It's just a different way of doing the pressure. Gavin was able to do that. He had to have a round of steroids to do that, which they really counseled us on because there is a risk with doing this certain type of, it's a certain type of steroid. I don't remember the name of it, but it does have a slight risk for things like learning disabilities and things like that in the future. But they said the risk of that was the risk of being on the vent longer was worse than that. So he had the medicine and then he was able to come off onto the BiPAP as well. And so once they could do that, I feel like they got just much steadier from there. We could also hold them like a regular baby at that point. So we could hold them. Our hospital did allow you to hold the babies when they were on the ventilators. We did, it's called kangaroo care. So basically they're just in their little diaper and then we would like have our shirt down a little bit and, but you just held them on your chest and no one moved. They draped you with blankets and things, but you, and that was amazing. That was wonderful. But then once they came off of the vents, then you could actually like swaddle them and just hold them in your arms like you would a normal baby. So I remember I have a picture of like the first time I think I held Gavin first like that. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm actually holding my baby like a baby. And then the other thing too, is when they take the breathing tubes out from the ventilators, then that's the first time you can also hear them cry. And so that's the first time, and you hate to hear a baby cry, but in those situations, you really love to hear your baby cry. Yeah, yeah, because it's like that's, you didn't hear it when they were born either. Right. And so, and then when they, you know, so the CPAP mask basically looks like if you know what a CPAP for like a person who has sleep apnea, that's very similar mask. And so every so often they kind of have to take it off for a split second to kind of change, you know, do whatever they need to, to change things. And so they would always have you come over because for just like one second, you could see, you could could take a picture where there's no face. Yeah. (laughs) So, so yeah, I feel like at that point, that's when things really took a turn for the better. So then they were on CPAP for a while and then they, then they moved on to nasal cannula. So it's kind of like what you would see anyone out in the community who has oxygen, but they start them on a bigger tube so that they get more oxygen. And this whole time they've been having, they had feeding tubes, not permanent. They they had it in their mouth. So then when they decided they were ready to start breastfeeding, they moved the feeding tube to their nose so that they could get a better latch. And we started working with breastfeeding. They would let them try for about 30 minutes. And then after that, they would use more calories than they would gain. So after that, they would still give them a feeding of their their normal mixture of breast milk and formula through their feeding tube. And they they did okay, but then the speech therapist came in um, and realized that they were um, they were aspirating because little babies just have such a hard time coordinating suck, swallow, breathe, and it, breast milk is is pretty thin. So they did a bunch of swallow studies, and then unfortunately, we had to take them off the breast milk and put them on thickened formula. So that was the end of my breastfeeding and pumping. However, I did have things stored in a freezer, and so they could get that when they were older. So once they kind of figured that out, and they had to kind of figure out the exact balance of like how to thicken it correctly. And I think, again, I think they need to do all this differently now. Once they got that, then they were pretty much like the feeders and the growers. So at that point, they are in more of a open crib, kind of like if anyone had a baby full term, the little beds they lay lay in, they're in those safe time of beds. So I could, they still had a lot of tubes and wires, but I could go over if one of them was crying and I could just go over and pick them up on my own, as opposed to asking a nurse to help me or so that was huge. Just being able to say, oh, my baby needs something. Let me go help take care of my baby. And so, yeah, at that point, they they would still have their oxygen and heart rate dip occasionally, but it was nothing like in the beginning. I mean, in the beginning, it was just constant, but it would just be every once in a while. And they just worked on getting bigger. They tried taking the oxygen off and it just didn't really work for either one of them yet. So when we did eventually go home, they did come home on oxygen and monitors 
for a little while. Which is common. I know, especially that, you know, when babies are born at that age. So I want to know at this point when they are on the nasal, I'm just losing track of how old they were. So you said at about seven weeks, they did the CPAP. They went to the CPAP. Okay. So that was about two months. Did they both about come out off at the same time? They did, which was really very surprising because, because he was sicker. He just, needed the steroids to come off the vent and then she didn't. So that was the only difference. So seven weeks. So about two months is when they went to the CPAP. They were on that for about, I'm thinking it was about three weeks. So eventually at about, about three months was when they went to the cannula. And at that point they would have been 32 weeks, I believe, like gestation. I think I'm getting that right. So I know, I'm like, I can't goal, do math. <laughs> Don't ask me to do math right now. I think they were about three months old when they um, went on to the nasal, the first nasal cannula. And then they just slowly made it to the smaller cannula. And then they just reduced over time how much oxygen they were getting through it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I want to know what were they telling you your discharge requirements were for them? Because I know some people, you know, they say they think that you have to be a certain pound, right? You have to be five pounds to leave the NICU. But I think it's a little bit different than that. Right. And so they had said from the beginning, they said our goal is to get them home by their due date. But like you said, obviously, that is the goal, but they have to meet a lot of different things. So they had to, because they were not going home with a feeding tube, they had to demonstrate that they could eat enough calorie wise in terms of their bottles. So, and not need that, that additional feed. So they had to demonstrate that they had to be on a certain amount of oxygen because it was through their nose and like not through a trach. So kiddos with trachs, that's a whole different story, but they, there's only so much oxygen you can do through the nasal cannula for the kids that I understood. So they had to be down to that much oxygen. And then on that amount of oxygen, they had to go a certain number of days without what they called spells. So a spell would be if their oxygen went below a certain level, if their heart rate went below a certain level. So if you were counting down and they were doing great and you were almost there, and then they had a spell, then you started over. So they really did pretty good with that. I believe we had, it sounds so silly not to know, but they had multiple mild infections along the way. So we were getting pretty close and then we had to have a couple, they'd gotten blood transfusions this whole time. And so right towards the end, they got another blood transfusion kind of as like a booster. And then they did really well. They had to pass a car seat test. So basically you have to bring in their car seat they have to sit up in their car seat for, I believe our requirement was an hour since we were 30 minutes away. I think it just kind of depends on how far you have to go. And they have to show they can do that without any spells. Thankfully, they both did great with that. Oh, good. Did um, they only ha- They only did the car seat test once and they passed? They only did it once. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. So, And then they had all of the, as you get towards the end, they do all the things that you would typically do like when you just have the baby in the hospital. So they do like the hearing tests and they do the, you know, I'm trying to think what else would they do? Just all of those normal like baby screens. Oh, vaccination. They did do their vaccinations on their normal rate. So even though when they were like two months old, they were adjusted two months old, they still went ahead and given their vaccines, circumcision, all of that stuff. So they, it's kind of like tying up all the loose ends. And then they have to make sure that you have all of your follow-up care set up. So we had our oxygen set up at home. We had, we didn't have home nursing with us, but we had home nurses visiting us for a while, special services. So like PT, OT, things like that. And then the follow-ups with all the specialists. So we had the um, pediatrician, of course, um, we had the, a lot the babies that are born that young are really high risk for retina issues. And so we had a follow-up with the retina doctor, that is one thing my kids did not ever struggle with. Yeah, Good. everyone has glasses, but the doctors have always been amazed that n- neither kid had issues with that. We had, Hannah had a congenital heart defect that strangely independently of her being a micropremie, 
Oh, so it was. It doesn't have it. It didn't have anything. And she did, would have had it anyway. Did they find that before, like with your anatomy ultrasound or something? No, they oh. didn't. They found it. They noticed it because it was a murmur. So she has what's called pulmonary valve stenosis. They caught it really early because she was getting all these other, like because they were being watched so closely. She's done fine with it. We just see a cardiologist once a month, but we have specialists, you know, follow up with that. And then she had. It's called cholestatic jaundice. It's not normal preemie baby jaundice. It's something else. And that really confused the doctors for a while. They weren't really sure why she got that. And so um, she had a liver specialist to go through. They could treat it, but they were trying to figure out why. So we had tons of like genetic screenings and things. And it ended up just being from her like IV nutrition that she had for a while. But they had to rule out all of these scarier things. So she had a liver specialist. There may have been some other specialists, but they wanted to make sure you had all those appointments lined up before you left the hospital. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I did want to ask too, I know a lot of moms, you know, when they have these unexpected things happen early, their mental health is kaput. So did you do anything? Did you talk to anybody? Like what, did you have any coping mechanisms that you use like during this whole time? I did not talk to anyone. I strongly suggest people do. We had a very good social worker who would come in and chat, but I didn't have like a therapist I was seeing. But looking back, I would strongly suggest people do that. I feel like in my case, I did okay when I went through it. I think because I had so much adrenaline and I was just focusing on minute by minute. What became really hard for me was when they were about two, because at that point, you know, they're off the oxygen They're When they came home, they were medically stable, but we, he, if they got sick, you know, Gavin would still be in and out of the emergency room. So they were still sicker than your average baby. And by about two, that was a little, I, I think I was starting, my brain was starting to realize I was a little safer And then that's when it kind of started going back and really digesting kind of what happened. And that's when I started to have more of anxiety issues. Like I wouldn't call it postpartum anxiety because it came so much later, almost more of like a PTSD, to be honest. And so I tried dealing with it on my own for a while. I was terrified to drive them anywhere in the car. I was so sure that something awful was going to happen. And so I did eventually talk to my doctor And they prescribed me anti-anxiety medication and it helped so much. And so in addition to that, you know, I journaled a lot. I, you know, I had gotten back to running and that helped me a lot. So I definitely had some other things I was using, but I really truly just needed some medication to help me get through that part. And that's kind of what changed everything. But like I said, if I were to do it all over, or if I were talking to someone else, I would say, find a therapist, find someone, a counselor. I think that would be super, super beneficial. Yeah. I know a lot of, a lot of people find comfort too, with just like community, like Facebook groups. There are a bunch of just groups you can find with preemie moms and people posting and just finding that community is really, really beneficial for a lot of people too. And there's good groups. So back then, eight years ago, there wasn't quite like Instagram wasn't really quite as big. Facebook was really big. And so I had joined a couple micro preemie Facebook groups. In the very beginning, I had to kind of get off because there's just so much that can go wrong with a micro preemie. Yeah. So it just increased your anxiety even more. Yeah. And I kindly decided, I finally decided, you know what, I, I'm not going to deal with one of these issues until we actually have it. Now, there are some amazing Instagram, like there's some podcasts and some Instagram accounts that would have been great. So I definitely think there's a little bit more out there, out there now. And I was eventually able to go back to those Facebook groups, but not while they were actually in the NICU. And then I could actually do more on the like giving advice side, which I think that has really helped. And then over the years too, there was a group of girls, a group of moms from our hospital that we haven't been doing it since COVID, unfortunately, but we would get together and we would make these little canvases and then the nurse would stamp, nurses would stamp the baby's footprints and, and things on them to like give to the current NICU moms. And being with those women was amazing because they, everybody's story was a little bit different, but we'd all experienced a very similar thing. 
So hopefully, hopefully, maybe as the pandemic gets a little bit better, we might be able to start doing some of that again. But that was really, really helpful too. I bet. That sounds so great. I think we're, I hope, knock on wood, I think we're almost to that point that things are starting to loosen up a little bit. So I want to go back to your discharge. So how many days or how many weeks did they spend and how big were they when they came home? So they came home and what's crazy is they came home on the same day. I was going to ask that really, too, because that's, yeah, that's usually never happens. I feel like uncommon yeah. and the nurses and doctors, from what I understand, they don't have a lot of leeway with that just because of insurance and things like that. They, I don't know how they ended up being ready on the same day, but they did. So they came home. The feeding dysfunction held us up just a little bit. So we were there for 122 days. So they came home one day before their four month birthday. So our goal was to be home by 40 weeks. And I think it ended up being like 41 and a half or something like that. So we were really close. And they were in the like six and a half pound range when they came home. And and then it's just, I mean, they, what, every time they'd hit, like by the time they hit four pounds, I was like, these guys are huge. And by the time <laughs> they were five pounds, I was like, oh my gosh, look how big they are. Because, you know, when you see them at one pound, mm-hmm. you think a five pound baby has like rolls. Yeah. And so at the time, I will say my cousin had a five pound baby a few years later and I thought, oh, this baby's going to look big. No, the baby looked tiny. It was just because in that moment, I was so used to it. So yeah, they came home at about six and a half pounds and then they kept gaining pretty well. Like the nurse came to our house and weighed them a few times a week. And they, in the beginning, we were having some feeding issues, but you know, we got help and they got going and kind of, I mean, they're still small, but we're also small people. So they weren't going to be kids to begin with. And so, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. They, they were giant when they came home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when they came home, then what was kind of y'all's routine with, did you have people, I know you said you had nursing staff and people coming in that way to support you, but did you have any family or anybody like yes. in the area that you could get support from too? Yeah. So okay. my husband was able to take, he took about a week and a half off when I had them and about another couple of weeks when we came home. And my parents are really close too. They had actually had to move down to Texas for about six years and they were trying to get back. And as soon as I went into the hospital on antepartum, like my dad found a job, they found a house, they, they moved right up. So I had them. And then we had a lot of really good friends. The hard part is you also, we came home in October. So we came home in like cold flu RSV season. So we also were pretty much locking them down. And so We had to, anyone who came over had to have their flu shot. They had to have their, is it the Tdap shot? Yeah, they had to have that one. We didn't want them around any kids because they told us like kids, we just, they're just, you know, they're in school and things like that. They're snotty and yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so a lot of our friends would do amazing things. Like they would just drop food off on our front porch and things like that. Or we would like talk to them, but this was way pre COVID, but we kind of did the six feet away thing, like way before it was the new way. So they were all very helpful, but we also had to limit how much help we actually could have just because we were risking them getting sick. More people coming in. Yeah, I know that makes sense. Kind of last question, how are they doing now? And do they have any, you know, any issues now? Yeah. So they're, oh, they're like our miracle kiddos. So Hannah, so they're, they're eight years old. They're in the second grade. So Hannah has very limited, um, like you never, you never know if you saw her that she had such a rough start at life. She runs, she jumps, she's going to do softball and the swim team this year. The only issue she has, she does have ADHD, which who knows, she might've had that anyway. And You know, we do follow up with her heart, but she has no limitations for it. She has a few like sensory issues. So she does go to OT every other week and she's a little behind in school, but not to the point where, I mean, we do a little bit of extra work with her, but not to the point where, you know, we're having to do anything extreme. So amazing. And then Gavin also has done amazing. He does have, he has cerebral palsy, but on the spectrum of cerebral palsy, he's just about as mild as you can get. So he, you know, he's got some higher tone in his legs and a little bit of core weakness, but he will run, he will jump. He's a little bit slower than some of the other kids, but he kind of, you know, he kind of just looks like a little clumsier kid. He's going to do baseball this year. He loves 
swimming. He has a little, my, him, him and my husband got him this like go kart. It goes almost 30 miles an hour. And that's something he can do. And he's not limited at all by his CP. So he gets in that go kart and scares me to death, but he does that. You know, he wears glasses, like little things like that. He does also have ADHD and he does get special ed in school, but he's in the same classroom as all the other kids. We just have to do tutoring and some things like that. So, I mean, considering their start and considering their brain leads, they, they have just amazed us. Like they just blow us away every day by everything they've accomplished. Oh, I love that. And that's why I try to get our story out there because when you're, in that situation, you're just so desperate for hope. And then especially when we had the brain bleed situation, I mean, I was a physical therapist. I wasn't a pediatric physical therapist, but I knew what that could mean. And so I just want to get our story out there to other moms and dads and grandmas and whoever to show it can be okay. That being being said, I'm a huge, huge fan of early intervention. So I think that's so important you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, whatever's needed. So they've worked hard to get to where they are, but they have just, like I said, they've just amazed us how they've done. They sound like they're doing great. That's so great. Well, Heather, thank you so much for joining me today. This was such an inspiring, wonderful story. Do you want to share your social media or where people can see Gavin and, you know, just can look at pictures or follow you or do whatever, you know? Absolutely. So (laughs) my, uh, my Instagram, I have, I have two Instagrams. So my main one, my family one is called learning to breathe book. And just to touch on really quick, so I self-published two books since I had them. So the first one's called Learning to Breathe, and that's where that comes from. And that's just about their NICU journey. And then I recently published one. So I'm also a pelvic health PT. So I published the NICU Mama Survival Guide, which when I went through the NICU, even though I knew exactly what to do because of my job, I just completely disregarded it because you, you don't take time for yourself. You take time. You're only focused on your babies. And so it's a way having the experience of both ways moms could kind of have some postpartum recovery without ever leaving their baby. So all the info on that, and then all of the family pictures and their therapies and their, all their progress and everything that's on learning to breathe book. And then I also have one that's Heather Evans DPT. And that's just a little bit more of a work one, but yeah, learning to breathe book is the place to be for Hannah and Gavin. For Hannah and Gavin, all the Hannah and Gavin content. Awesome. Well, we'll put those links in the show notes page for anybody who wants to connect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for letting me share their story. I'm always happy to get it out whenever I can to help out anyone else who might be going through it. Yes. Love it. Love it. All right, guys, that wraps up this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and letting me be a part of your motherhood journey. It is truly an honor. If you like what you heard, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And I love hearing what you guys think of the podcast. So if you're liking what you hear or you have a suggestion, I'd be so grateful if you'd go ahead and leave me a review wherever you're listening to help more mamas just like you find the show. What do you think? Are you starting to feel a little more confident about your pregnancy and birth? Well, if you want more, be sure to head on over to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast for today's show notes and a library of episodes so you can keep getting educated before your upcoming birth. And while you're over there, be sure to check out the blog and learn about our online birth classes. Find it all and more over at mommylabornurse.com slash podcast. See you next week. Same time, same place.